There we go. All right, welcome everyone. I'm uh, very grateful you're here. Um, today I want to talk about uh, seven habits. The seven habits of uh, highly effective chief information security officers. Um, this is a topic that is uh, special to me. Um, it's born out of first-hand observation of a lot of CISOs out there. And for starters, I use the term CISO uh, in this literal sense, uh, but also um, as you know, sort of a placeholder for individuals who have the highest job title uh, that involves respons overall responsibility for protecting the assets of your organization. So, so by that definition, just to sort of level set with, with everyone in attendance here, uh, how many CISOs are there? Two, three, thank you. How many former CISOs, recovering CISOs? Two, thank you. How many aspiring CISOs? Actually, the minority. Oh, well, which one? Thank you. So, so fantastic. We have a pretty sort of even, even uh, group. And so for the, the former and current CISOs, please you know, hold, hold me honest. Um, I might look to you to nod or disagree and uh, have a conversation. And for those of us in the aspirational column, uh, this is going to be my contribution of what it takes for us to be effective. So I'll start off by doing some level setting and, uh, and then you know, we'll, we'll go from there. So why should you listen to me, right? Uh, first of all, because you're here, uh, let's face it, uh, um, and you might as well. But more importantly, because you know, in my 11 years working in information security, I have got to shadow quite a number of CISOs. So essentially, as a consultant, uh, you know, our engagements involve going into an organization and at the CISOs behest, you know, sort of helping them set up a governance program or interacting with a cross-section of the organization. And so you get a pretty good sense, or at least I have gotten a pretty good sense of, in many organizations of how they function, how IT is, is um, perceived within, sorry, how the CISO's group is perceived within IT, and how the rest of the organization perceives the CISO, the CISO and his group. And so that has sort of provided me with, with this nomenclature um, that I'm going to introduce here, and uh, at least an observation, and that is, I've observed what I refer to as the scapegoats. Um, it's one mode of operation of CISOs. And the other mode of operation I, I term forms. So let me illustrate. Um, the, the scapegoats, but before, before going to that illustration, let me use one last analogy just to sort of you know, bring this, make, take this home. So I liken um, sort of my experience as being involved, having the, the opportunity to participate in a lot, you know, listen on the pre-game, you know, motivation speeches of a lot of coaches, right? So, if anyone's a professional sports enthusiast, um, before you go into the arena, the coach gives the team a rah rah, you know, a battle cry. So, I've gotten the opportunity to listen to many of these, and so this is where I'm, this is what I'm drawing from, and this is from where I've made the observation about the scapegoats and and the performance. So. I am uh, I've been known to uh, shadow, I, AKA stalk, a bunch of these performers um, on LinkedIn, on Twitter. I get um, every so often messages from people saying, "Hey, I just wanted you to check my profile." And uh, so I, I have I have a very intense fascination in reconstructing what it takes to be sort of effective in your role and, and why. So back to illustrating the scapegoats. Essentially, they their mode of operation is born out of that deeply held sense that it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when the breach is going to happen, right? So we have this meme that's very common in our community, right? And that's the mode of operation of the scapegoat mentality. It's they, they, they behave and their sort of their outlook is reconciling against that moment, that moment of breach. How am I going to look? How is my team going to look? The performers, on the other hand, they, they lean forward. So, they acknowledge um, that moment, but it's almost incidental. Uh, they see themselves as you know, being present to provide protective assurance for the organization to do what it needs to do. So if the organization wants to go left, they say, okay, in order to go left, you know, this is what we need. We need A, B, and C. And, and that, that, that's, these aren't fixed labels. They're more sort of preferences, kind of like personality types. Um, I've seen the same CISO operate 
from both poles at different points in time. So what's the inspiration? Why is this important, right? The last week we talked about the importance of the why. So this is my why. So the inspiration for this, for this talk, for me, was my mother. So my mother is a pediatrician. Uh, she, works in, she works in public health. And in early 2004, um, she, she and her team from the Ministry of Public Health, they came up with a very startling statistic. So 45% of children in Balmayo, which is a, a city about a village, quite frankly, about 50 kilometers from the capital city of Cameroon, 45% of the children under five were dying. Now, now think about that for a second. So as a result of this, uh, the chief, the local chief, thought it was witchcraft. So he put out an APB, if you will, for witch doctors, you know, within neighboring villages and the you know, the circumference of, you know, witch doctors <laughs> coming to the force kept increasing. And my mom and her team, they went in there, you know, to sort of try and figure it out. Now, at first, the chief was hesitant to give them permission because he was like, whoa, I'm not going to be responsible, you know, if, you know, the evil forces come after you. He, you know, he didn't want to be responsible for that. So after, it took some, some, you know, a lot of uh, negotiation. But finally, um, you know, the, the chief gave them permission, you know, to, to try and figure it out, to use their white magic, as he called it reference to medicine. So they went in there and immediately they set out to find out, to find out the children that weren't dying, the positive demons. What were they doing differently? Right? And so they found, you know, the children within that population group and they monitored them very closely. They tried to figure out, you know, what they ate, what kind of families they came from and all that kind of stuff. And what they found out were two things that jumped out of them relatively quickly. And this is a condensed version of a of you know, some, some quite a bit of time. But what jumped out at them were two things. A, those children, on average, had a smaller number of siblings, right? So they, they were smaller families. And B, those children had a more balanced diet. They ate more, you know, varied types of foods. Now, what's important to note here is that in this community, they're a subsistence community. So they, they do a lot of farming, and they, they grow mainly a, a root called cassava. It's very versatile in a number of ways you can eat it, so you can make quite a bit of things from cassava. And so armed with this sort of, with this punch, with this information, what they did was they identified um, a group of mothers, which they put they term Mama Lumiere, which in French can be translated as mother of light. But th these are more like beacons, beacons within the community. So elderly, some of the more elderly and more respected women. And they taught them on what constitutes a balanced diet. So they said, you know, bring in a little fish, bring in a little meat. And these are all things that were local you know, to them, not you know, things that they needed to do at great really expense to, to get. And so they trained these women, and these women in turn organized daily feedings. So the women would decide, they would sort of rally around other groups of women, and they would assign responsibility. Okay, you bring fish, you bring meat. So it wasn't burden, too burdensome on anyone in the and then they had, you know, they had daily feedings, and they weighed, you know, the group of children beforehand. And after ten weeks, the results were dramatic. Um, I, I wish I had a chart to show you, but they kept data about. And so what happened was two things: a, you know, these children because they had, you know, focused feeding, you know, someone feeding them as opposed to them fighting off, fighting with their siblings, siblings around the same plate. They had more nourishment, and b, you know, they had more diversity. And so at the time of, of, after 10 weeks, at the time of my mother and her team leaving, they quickly identified, you know, that the problem solved, right? Malnutrition. And so, it's funny, there's actually video footage of the chief, you know, rallying the village and the entire village, you know, thanking and honoring my mother and her team, um, and, and basically, you know, proclaiming that the white man's magic is better than their version of magic. So what's the underlying theme here? The underlying theme here is positive deeds. Who are the rock stars within our community and what are they doing, right? And what I'm about to present is sort of my humble uh, perspective on, on that matter. And if any of this sounds familiar, um, you know, it's because it is, right? People are actively doing that. So has anyone ever heard of the IT Process Institute? Yes, no? 
So I, I, I encourage you to check it out. Um, it is an organization entirely devoted to understanding what you know, those beacons of excellence are within our community, are within different IT organizations. And, and they do a lot of publications centered around, around you know, what their observations are. So why is all of this important? Well, it's pretty important for the same reasons that leadership is important, right? So I have to be careful, I have to do um, attribution on this slide. This is from an outfit named CSC uh, Consulting. And they, they came up with what I think is you know, a really brilliant illustration of you know, what leadership provides and the different types of outcome. So what you're looking at is a matrix, if you will, and it always starts with vision on the left, and then the things that can flow as an offshoot of that vision. So you have the skills, the incentive structure, the resources, and an action plan. Now, when all of these things come to you know come into perfect alignment, you get change. You know, you actually get positive change. Now, going down sort of through the middle there, um, well, diagonally, um, if there's no skill, if there's vision with no skill, then you get a situation where it can be confusing or you know just a lot of anxiety. When you get vision without any incentives, you get into you know sort of disbelief. People don't people don't buy it. When you get vision and skills and incentives with no resources, there's stagnation. Now, is any of this resonating with, with anyone in your organizations? And, and you know the ways in which we baffle. So this is why this is important. This is why leadership matters. And this is why sort of I think it is imperative that as an as a as a community rather, you know, we sort of discern between we sort of come up with some some way to sort of work the soft skills. What soft skills are important that people need to have and bring to bear? I mean, all of this assumes a certain underlying baseline of competence when it comes to skill set, right? These are about you know those those more nuanced skills that we need to have in order to affect change within our organization. So the next uh, chart that you see is our people, process, and technology. Right? Again, when these come into alignment, in perfect greed, you know, there's success, right? And who influences this? Who influences this at your organization more than anyone? It's the CISO, right? The, the CISO is ultimately responsible for the alignment of people, process, and technology. And, and so you look at the different permutations. Um, the way you have good technology and good process, and good process, sorry, without you know the right people, you know, you see poor adoption. Um, how many people can relate to that, right? Um, when you have good people, good technology, and no process, right? Inconsistent operation. And and my favorite act is actually the bottom, the last one. You know, where you don't have any of your above, and you know. But is this resonating? Can anyone understand? Is there a doubt in anyone's mind as to why this is important for us to come up with a nomenclature, if you will, for the skill sets that are required and the mindsets that are required to be effective as a CISO? Any questions so far? Fantastic. So assume that we're all on board and so we're going to move forward. So, in terms of CISO responsibilities, um, what we've seen um, historically is sort of a shift from an evolution, if you will, from that technical CISO, the CISO who's sort of, you know, uh, the config who worries about systems and systems and configuration settings more so than anything else, to now sort of a more strategic role where, where the CISO gets invited, you know, with other executives to sort of contribute to what strategic direction of the company, right? So the holy grail, according to a, a CISO friend of mine, the holy grail, according to him, is he'll know he'll have, he'll have arrived the day when his threat intelligence information is on the same vein as the marketing intelligence information. So in other words, he wants to get to that point where, you know, when the organization is considering, considering what lines of business to get into, and you're doing your strategic SWOT analysis, you know, your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. He wants them to look at the information that he provides on par with marketing intelligence. I, I think that's a very worthy aspiration, and I, I submit that you know, to the rest of the community for the discussion you know, about, about that and, and for aspiration. Really. So, from a CISO's desk, uh, who are the people that matter, right? Or who are the people that sort of consume the CISO's attention? Um, you know, this is. 
a, a, mind, a simple mind map that illustrates my observation of all those clusters of people are. You know, you have the attackers, you have the CISO's boss, you have the, the, the staff, and then you have the business units, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the people, the, the, people over at on the other side, as they call them, and then the customers, these people who consume the stuff, you know, the, the product or the services that the organization um, is producing. And then, you know, quite frankly, you know, the assessors, you know, internal and external. And, and in my observation, and I'm, you know, I'm looking at the room keeping to those individuals who raised their hand earlier as a current and former CISOs, um, in my observation, the more scape, the, the, the CISOs that operate from the operation of scapegoat, they tended to spend a disproportionate amount of their time focused on attackers and assessors. And then those that were more strategic in, in, in spending their time, those performers, as I call them, tended to spend a lot more of their time on business units and customers. Does that resonate? Right, good question. So these are internal auditors. These are QSAs, um, you know, people who, who basically come into the CISO's environment and tell them how good they're doing. Does that make sense? The AIG. I'm sorry? The AIG. There, there you go, the AIGs of the world. So with that, with this panoramic view out of the way, I'd like to go into uh, what I observe to be the seven attributes of performance, or the seven attributes that sort of push people, um, individuals, more towards the performer um, part of the continuum than the scapegoat. And the first one is serious play. So this is sort of, uh, this is from Carl Jung, you know, the famous psychologist whose contribution to society was the notion that we all have archetypes, right? We all have different, uh, different parts of ourselves. And what's really important to note here is that the CISOs that are more, that are performance, you know, that are the performers, they only they sort of integrate their inner child with their adult. So they, they sort of have a healthy dispassion. They have a, they sort of are dispassionate in a healthy way from their position. They have a healthy they sort of a healthy distance away from the gravity of what their responsibility is. So I'll, I'll give you an illustration. So one of uh, the CISOs that I, I uh, and sort of motivated this talk. He's, he referred me, he said to me once, he goes, Franklin, you know, I see myself as the bodyguard of the VIP. It's my responsibility to make sure that, you know, he stays alive, he or she stays alive. And inevitably, I know that there's going to come a point where shots will be fired. And quite frankly, I could die. Or if I don't die, you know, my VIP will die. And I have to, and, and let's pause for a second and think about that statement, right? I mean, that invites the full gravity of sort of having to save this person's life or die in the process. I mean, that's pretty weighty. Now, a performer, on the other hand, you know, same circumstance, and his mindset, his whole mindset is more, look, my job is to protect this individual. I have no control whatsoever about it when shots will be fired. So I'm not going to dwell on that. What I will do is essentially you know, prepare myself the best way I can and, my, and have my, my, my um, guard, my, my, my VIP, uh, wear a protective vest, and, and then that enables them to do what they need to do. And, and so I don't have to be on edge all the time. So it's sort of a, it's sort of a healthy sort of distance away from you know, the gravity of what your role implies. So what's important to know here before I move on is notice the lack of ego, right? If that's the P differentiator, is ego. So take out the ego and you get the performance. Now, how many, I mean, how many people can relate, right, to the sort of prevalence of very ego-driven conversations within our community, right? And that's a rhetorical question, unless someone has a joke and a comment to that. All right, so the next skill um, that differentiates uh, performers from scapegoats is that of focus. Um, so performers are able to tackle on, take on one thing at a time. And, 
and, and focus here, you know, is particularly important because we live in, you know, the era of big data, right? Um, we have Twitter, you know, I'm sure some people are live tweeting this. We have so many things that, you know, deluge, you know, our attention, I mean, that grab before our attention. And so, it's almost like the ability to filter the, the noise from the signal is way more important than any other skill that we could have at this point in time. And, and the example I have here is I was sitting here with the CISO delivering sort of you know an end of assessment or anything that's been important. And while while sitting in his office, we kept getting interrupted, you know, for every five or so minutes with some new emergency. And each of them sounded really, you know, pretty important to me. If I were him, I would have definitely said, okay, frankly, hold on, I have to go address this. But he just sort of had this, you know, you know, attitude that he was, he was going to be okay. And so at the end of the briefing, you know, I said, well, help me understand, like, you just think those, those things are pretty important. And he pulled out a do not do list. So how many people maintain a do not do list? <laughs> I see it too much. I mean, this is how sort of militant he was about protecting his time and his focus. And the point of it was he pre-committed about not doing certain things during certain periods of time. In other words, he ran his organization, and these are his words, in periods of sprints and then jobs. So the sprints are, you know, the get things done, you know, the sort of either augmenting the maturity level of a process or being strategically focused in introducing a whole new direction and a whole new series of initiatives that need, you know, sort of to be put into processes of people and technology. So that, those were the sprint periods. The jobs were sort of, you know, the more home home, keep the lights on kind of thing. And during periods of sprint, he had literally a laser-like focus. I mean, nothing was going to sort of detract his, his, his attention. Now, that, Two things came, you know, came to mind as I, as I you know, sort of observed that situation. One was the fact that his teams became a lot more resourceful um, because they knew they couldn't count on him, you know, which was, I mean, I think was, was absolutely amazing. Is okay, we can't count on the CISO to, to divert the attention, so we have, we have, we're going to have to look for a way to figure it out. And then the second thing that came to mind, you know, quite frankly, well, came to mind much later in conversation with Wendy, my mentor was uh, a line from uh, The Avengers, and Samuel L. Jackson has a very famous line in there where he goes, until such a time, you know, that the world is coming to an end, we shall move as if it intends to continue spinning. Right, I'm trying to paraphrase it. But the point here is, you know, let's go back to, to the story of, of the kids from Baumayo, right? People aren't dying. People aren't dying. It's let's maintain perspective and let's keep focus on what's really important so we can accomplish the mission of the organization. Can you give maybe some also some examples of that to-do list? Of the to-do list? You're focused on you know the, the grand mission of the to-do list, um, staying focused, I should say. But what so, else did you see on it? Excellent. So the question was, for, for those in the back of the room, the question was, what are some of the things that were on the not to do list of that CISO that I mentioned? So patching, right? Um, and, and this is, it. I'm glad you asked that question, because I, I sort of had this repertoire, this list of questions that I ask a lot of CISOs that I, 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 you know, I get an opportunity to interact with. And one of the questions on there is, what takes up your time that you wish you did not, right? Like, what are some of the time drains for you? And patching is huge on this CISO's list. And it, it, funny enough, internal audit, you know, interactions with you, internal audit was, was on there. We had basically a blocked amount of time he wasn't able to interact with the Thank you. So do you mean that, that these are things that you would not do during these sprints? Correct. These are things that you would not do during these sprints, absolutely. So the next trait is that of Bradley changes, right? And um, essentially, this is about ginning up, you know, spirited debate. This is about, you know, introducing just the right amount of controversy so that people don't go through the motions. So in our community, we have a lot of, you know, standard conversations. It's very interesting when you read articles from five, ten years ago, and you, you see that they, they're equally applicable. Uh, 
Um, some of it because it, the issues are still salient, um, but a lot of it, quite frankly, because you know, I attribute it to intellectual laziness. Um, you know, we, we just don't push ourselves into sort of grounding it more, making things more, 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 more relevant to the to the current time. And so this CISO that I, I inspired this this um, this this bullet point or this trait. I have never met anyone the ability to sort of breathe emotion out of anyone <laughs> than this guy. So he has he has what I call cage rattling questions that he uses as devices to make people think. And I'll give you an example. So one of them was he asked his team, he said, if um, the company hired a screenwriter from Hollywood and they were about to do a movie about our team, what role shall we be assigned? Right? I mean, that's sort of like from left field. It inspires a whole new way of thinking about the department and the role that you want to be. Another question he asked was, you know, if your mother were to design, you know, this system or some particular process, what would she do? And the point here, you know, because the, the, the emotion can kind of get out of hand, uh, but the point here is emotional content, not anger, right? So you don't want to get people angry and detract from the position of the the, the, the the intent. What you want to do is gin up just the right amount of, of sort of emotional fervor that people can stay away from sort of like the, you know, the patterns, the patterns of thinking and the patterns of conversation and actually have meaningful dialogue, especially when it comes to interacting with business units. Because they try to have as little to do to do with you as possible as this as a CISO. They, they sort of perceive the IT security group as, you know, we, we have to deal with, just tell us what to do and we'll do it, kind of thing. Um, and so bring it home to them, make it relevant, make it resonant. Um, um, an effective device is rather, you know, the, the cage rat. And, and you know, just to pause here for a second and, and sort of bring this all back to bring us all back in the thread we're going in. So these are all mindsets, right? These are these are you know sort of devices that are applicable um, with different tactics and with different variables within your specific environments. So there, there are tactics that go along with this, but I, I, as, as, I, as you listen to this, I want you to sort of switch the variables to your environment and figure out what set of tactics work. But it's more important to retain the sort of the mindset behind the, the traits. Does that make sense? All right. The next trait is empathy. Um, this is, you know, quite frankly, one of the most prevalent, and quite in a lot of ways, um, the most important one, next to um, the one about synthesize having a healthy discretion in your job, in your job title. And this is important for a couple of reasons. The biggest one be, you know, as you ascend up the corporate ladder, um, if you're not careful, um, you sort of get a, you sort of become, you know, have an unhealthy, an unrealistic impression of what really happens where the world needs to go. People tell you what they think you want to hear, and if you're not, if you don't deliberately, you know, try and, and sort of follow the division of, of, of knowing what's happening at the point, you know, of, at the point where the world needs to go. Lose, lose a lot of time. And so a lot of times the CISO's job is about managing expectations with, with that you know, panoramic view of stakeholders, right? And you can't manage expectations effectively if you don't sort of keep a pulse on what's going on within these different communities, right? So for any of the CISOs or that, that raised their hand initially, uh, I imagine you came up from so, sir, what, what uh, tracks did you came up through the network engineering rank, the uh, network engineering? So, as a CISO, uh, do you think it's important, or to what extent uh, do, you, do you think it's important to sort of go back to meet the network engineering teams and get a, a real sense of what's happening in the network? You're welcome to contribute. So, so, so he's, he's shaking his, you know, nodding and saying, wow, does anyone else care to contribute? Like, what kind of stories they have about making sure that they, they stay grounded. You guys should have held up on the t shirts. Yes, sir, please. Thank you. At my company, uh, instead of traditional talk, we have uh, sort of a group of people, three 
shifts 24 hours that are sort of uh, they're sort of on call permanently because they're all in one room. So they're all working on problems all the time. So I spend time in there sometimes to sort of get a sense of what they're dealing with and how they're dealing with it. So, and I find it uh, very helpful because it kind of uh, it often shows that what I thought was going on is totally wrong. Right, right. And, and this is, I really appreciate that because this is precisely um, what I was hoping to, to, to get out, you know, in this point. Is because, especially as an assessor, right, and I go into an organization as an outsider, and I go talk to the people at the point of acceptance of credit card data. And the things that they tell me are going on are quite frankly, completely different from what you know the CISO or the director of the process told me was going to be. I mean, I, I, it's, it's almost like, are you even in the same company? But, but a lot of times, you know, we've come to expect that, and it's, it's, I don't mean that in the condescending way. It's just people have different sensibilities. And so it, it, it drives home the importance of you know, seeking grounding influences, because as a CISO, um, you really have to make sure you can manage the expectations of The next trait is one of uh, keeping measurements, so keeping score, right? So um, this, I mean, uh, there's a lot of documentation out there, the list of publications, which I'm not going to bore you by regurgitating, about you know how the metrics program should work. You know, there's a very famous book. You know, how many people have heard of or read Andrew Jack Jackwitz? Yeah, yeah. So, so there's lots of really good guidance out there about, about metrics. So how I want to sort of incrementally um, you know, submit something to, to you for consideration is this one story about a CISO who does her best to mimic Wall Street. So the way Wall Street reports are, are done, she does her best to report her security program that way. So in addition to, to sort of doling out information about how they did this quarter, she basically relays that back to how they did you know, in a similar period last year. And this, I mean, she got so much resonance, so, so much traction from her executive leadership in that way. Because she's sort of speaking their language, right? This is how they this is how they communicate. They say how they and, and she gives you know factors that attribute to what different what disparity you know, exists between the now and the same period of last year. So what, I, what I'd just like to submit here is that it's not so much important what the measures are as what the trend lines indicate and what the story is for, for those trend lines. So the next one uh, that I've seen that really separates the performers from, from the scapegoats is, uh, you know, what, it's about the Medici effect, right? How many, how many people have heard of the Medici effect? So, so this is about basically combining different disciplines to come up with a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts, right? So, I mean, you see a nerdy uh, gentleman hugging the drag queen. Yeah, it's awkward. I mean, it's very awkward to get you know the infosec team to go spend time with the marketing people. Um, it's which is which? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and, and there's a meme. That's a hashtag because there's actually a meme. Within our community for upper parts, right? So the point is, let's embrace that as a community. Let's embrace sort of that diversity of, of, of discipline. So, and, and the goal here is to burst out of our patterns. So I have here um, a creative whack pack, and this is something that, quite frankly, I learned from this specific season. So, and I encourage anyone to to, you know, to reach out and get some. And essentially. It allows for creative thinking. And creativity and innovation, to use that term, is born out of creating new associations. And that's exactly what these cards do. So for anything you're thinking about, and this is quite literally what she does, she whips out a bunch of these at random and then reads them and then tries to apply them to your situation. So I just did the same thing. And the first one says, do the unexpected. Right? So, so that provokes a moment of thought. What will be unexpected about this new strategy or this new product or this new process that we're, we're trying to you know, What will be unexpected? And what's actionable, quite frankly, about the unexpected is if people are surprised, you know, 
positive for your thoughts, then they are more engaged. So that that could inform sort of you know that that notion. Um, there is one about ask what if. Um, there is one about simplify. You know how could we simplify this further? You know and, and essentially what you know what I'm hoping to accomplish by this by talking about this trait is highlighting how if you tackle things. We all have thinking patterns. We all have action patterns. And if you expand that a little further, our organizations have thinking patterns, and our organization has. Organizations have patterns of action. Um, they're not evident a lot of times, but they exist. And so, how can you create just the right amount of entropy, um, just the right amount of um, dissonance, so that cerebral combustions can happen? And and so, one of the things that I really invite this community to do. Um, and I will be doing the same kind of homework, is to first spend some time and think about people from dis different disciplines that we can invite. So, for example, next year at B-Sides, what if we had a track, right, that was devoted to, you know, epidemiologists, or, or just a wide open track, you know, where we invited an epidemiologist, a clown, and say, you know, um, uh, a pilot, right? What, what could we learn from those disciplines? And I encourage everyone to sort of spend some time and think about that just for a moment. You know, and, and in fact, I'd say, you know, if I dare say, if you're dreaming from the other mind, first you just have these different disciplines that we can interact with and sort of see what emerges. And, and my submission is only good things will happen. And then the next trait is that of sharing, right? Um, so all these different works um, are not important unless Communication and sharing is one of the most ignored pieces of advice, um, but it's still, it's nonetheless incredibly important. And the goal here is to, you know, on that matrix of stakeholders, you know, your well, minus your attackers sometimes, uh, <laughs> that you want to share what's happening. You want to, you know, provide situ situational awareness. You want to bring it home to them. You want to sort of have these moments where people at any given point in time understand what the organization is doing and how your role and theirs sort of intersect. So I have a, a CISO who inspires this and he's actually out of here in Las Vegas. And literally, this gentleman who briefed the janitor with the janitor walk in, or if he ran by the janitor. And, and you talk about things like SCADA, you know, talk about the industrial controls and how relevant it is for how important it is for the janitor to safeguard the room where the control is off because you know that they can turn off the lights or they I mean, he, he, he literally has a message you know, you know, for anyone and everyone. And the effect of that, from my observation, is that people would hear a story on the news and they would immediately reach out to him and be like, oh yeah, I saw a story and it was about this you know, company that, or this situation where they got reached. And it sort of brought it back home. And he, he was, is, in many ways, like a moving billboard for the importance of protecting the company's assets. So this is about sharing, right? And we all know that uh, sharing is caring, right? So um, with, with that, I really want to thank you all for listening and watching and and everyone's attention is still up here. Because that's, that's what has led up to this moment, right? So what I'm trying to do is share, share what I've learned. And I really look to, to you, you know, for feedback on for this current and former CISOs, you know, does that, does that resonate? Um, for, for aspiring CISOs, you know, is this something, are these things that we should devote time to? work on and towards and and you know and that's 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 the story as far as sharing is concerned. So with that I will uh, open up to questions and comments. Yes sir. The one habit that you didn't get into that I found to uh, be a key is listen. Active listening. Uh, all too often we come into uh, a situation where we think we have the answers. Uh, we know how to secure this, we know how to secure that we know what the risks are, blah, blah, blah. And of course, we come in with a pre-canned solution. Um, we don't see how it's completely appropriate in the situation because we haven't taken the time to listen, to understand, to put ourselves in the shoes of the other individual. Absolutely. So point well accepted, right? So how, how would we sort of incorporate this into, into the talk? When you're, I mean, your point is well received. And I think it, so did everyone hear the gentleman's comment? 
about the importance of listening as a so how I would sort of incorporate that or implicit in the point about empathy, you know, is this but you're absolutely right and it deserves emphasis all on its own. Because that is you know, there's a there there for listening. So I really appreciate that comment. Any any others? Yes sir. Franklin, um, you talked about empathizing and I agree completely and what I find one area of having come into the CISO role from a technical background. I can't, I find it very hard to empathize with folks in the roles that I previously held. Um, I have a great example. We're making a firewall for her change in one of the institutions, and the current firewall engineer was telling me how long this was going to take, and it was going to take weeks of prep time, and, and, and it was bullshit. And, and you're in that situation, and this is a 20 minute job, and you want to push him out of the chair and just say, move and let me do it. Right? Any advice? So, um, I don't know that he qualifies as advice, but I do have commentary, right? So, and um, I'll just give it to you straight. So the comment was, did everyone hear the comment? Okay. So what I, what I do have to say about that is, is the following. So I've read, uh, there is, um, I forget the elegant way to phrase it, but here's the concept. The concept is, we often evaluate people in roles that we formerly held by the time when we were at our best in that role. And we're sort of looking at them now and we're thinking, why does it take you five minutes? Why does it take you two days to do what I can do in 20 minutes? What is, you know, is, is we often forget a lot of times is that before it took us to the point where we took five minutes to do that job, we had the sucky period, right? And so, and so what, and, and nonetheless, I mean, that doesn't, uh, there is a, a, such a thing as competence, you know, that, that people need to have. And there's such a thing as, you know, business needs to get done. All I'm introducing is just that for consideration, right? Um, to what extent is there a sort of a growth period that as a CISO you can nurture in your team, right? So I imagine I'm going to get feedback from, me, from my world-class mentor over here about, you know, my suckiness during this, this <laughs> the suckiness factor during this, this talk, right? And, and so, if she were to evaluate me based on where she is now, I mean, that would be unfair. But but if she, you know, she puts that in, and that's, that's what I have to contribute. That's right. As far as that is. So, an insight I have thought. Any other comments or questions? Is there a name for that phenomenon? I, I forget, but there's a very elegant name. I, 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 it's like the sucky period. I just blank on it. But the gentleman's name is Rajesh, wait, no, Remit Sethi. So that's R A M I T S E T H I. And he, 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 he writes a blog, and one of the, the seminal books that he wrote is. Um, But if you, if you look up this name, the book is about how as IT professionals we should prevent ourselves from becoming sort of, um, so in the book he talks about the three days, automation, Asia, outsourcing, and uh, what was the last day? So Asia, automation, and, and um, consumer, uh, something about, um, basically our skills becoming more and more widely available. Like Modernization. I'm sorry? Commoditization. Commoditization. There you go. That's the term. The commoditization of our skills. As things get automated, as, as things get outsourced, and, and, and as you know, more and more of our skills as become commoditized, what do we add? And, and I will submit, you know, that that's you know that's something we ought to be thinking about. And, and, but that's the name, that's the general name of this concept about evaluating people and giving them some latitude that's something. Any any other questions I've really enjoyed this talk? Any other comments, jokes? I'm sorry? They're called creative whack pack. So, and, and another another um, thing that I learned from, from this lady uh, that I use is a book called um, Lateral Thinking. That may not be the name of the book, but the author's name is Edward de Bono. Um, so, D E and then space, B O N O. So, Edward de Bono. He, he, I mean, he waxes poetic about you know wearing different hats. It's called six hats thinking, I think. and it's about a concept called lateral thinking. You know, 
basically introducing entropy into you know, their thought patterns. And he literally talks about, you know, wearing, you know, a green hat, you know, looking, looking at the same sort of circumstances, you know, from a creative perspective. How can I, you know, make something out of nothing? And then looking at it from the perspective that we in IT get to wear a lot of, which is what is wrong with this? You know, and beating up into that in terms of what's wrong. And then looking at it in terms of what's right. And invariably, by doing that, you sort of come up with this incredible, incredibly comprehensive you know, outlook on it. And a lot of it also has to do with developing the capabilities. So as I mentioned, and it's very important to become successful up here that you retain, and these are mindsets, right? So the capabilities that go along with these mindsets um, don't have to all come from your team, right? Um, you, you can develop them. You can develop them by you know, interacting with the marketing folks, for example, or with the accounting folks, because they, they specialize in a certain, certain type of thinking, which according to Edward the Mormon, I think it's the way they can I forget. But it's the more facts and figures. You know, they want to see concrete and parable stuff. And then the marketers, they are more green hats. They want to you know, they see land fields, and they want to you know, be more green. So, so, and to sort of come back to your, your question, you know, something where you know someone is a sort of bullshitting you, know, um, the, the notion of how can you, you know, how can you look at it differently from the perspective of you know what you know, if you were to just put walk a mile in that position, would you necessarily see it that way? So, any any other questions or comments? Really good. Yes, sir. The question is, are, is there any notion, of, is there any, do I have any comments about how we come to be discerning to have a bad or a good C software? That, that's a good way, okay. So, um, yes I do, I have ideas. So, I talked about my repertoire of questions that I have um, for, for CISOs that I'm fortunate to interact with. One of the questions that I always ask them is, what would you base your bonus on, right? And I've got a very wide range of answers. Um, one day I hope to, you know, work with someone to sort of publish things. Because it's very interesting to me, you know, how how you know CISOs perceive themselves at, you know compared to how you know the rest of the organization perceives the CISOs. So to sort of come back to your question, um, how does an organization know if they have a good or a bad CISO? So my submission, or at least my contribution to that question, would be, you know, research, right? So research organizations exist. Like the 451, like garden, like forest, uh, they have co incredibly comprehensive documentation about you know what types of CISOs make sense for what types of organizations, um, what types of organizations makes what where where it makes sense for the CISO to report to, and so essentially, I, I'll answer your question as follows: research, and then B. Um, and this is sort of drives the heart of what I think emerges as a maturation of this process. You know, to what extent does your CISO embody, embody the performance traits? Um, and I imagine there's going to be some maturation that this will have to go through um, to incorporate you know, increased emphasis for listening. Um, but, but to what extent does your CISO, assuming a certain level of competency, right, embody these, these traits? I don't know, uh, you still have time, but you uh, interested me when you said, you asked them, you know, what, what do you want your bonus to be based on? Um, I, I'm big into incentives, <laughs> driving behavior, but at the same time, as a CISO, you're not producing revenue, you're the bodyguard. As a bodyguard, I mean, you just go by how many of your customers get shot, or how, how, how would you bonus that? So the question is, you know, if you want to know what, they, what these CISOs have responded to, to, to the question about, you know, how would you, you know, what would you base your bonus on? Do you want to answer that? Or do you want Actually, to yes. And you are producing revenue. You're just not aware of it because you're not tracking it. Take a look at how many of your customers have evaluated your security posture as an aspect of being willing to do business with you. That is how you can track the added value that you're bringing to your business. Look at that as a percentage over time. 
look at that as an absolute over time, start tracking it. If that value is decreasing, you are not adding enough value to your business. If that value is increasing, you are adding increasing value to the business as security becomes important to your customers. Um, you, you get security surveys from your customers, track who those customers are, uh, track successful engagements with them, track engagements that fall apart, track customers that you lose. Understand why you lost them, or security a part of why you lost them. Simple, basic business metrics that you should be collecting uh, that are the most important metrics you can possibly collect because they inform on exactly that issue. How effective are you being at meeting your customers' needs and bringing value into the business. Thank you, well said. Thank so, you. one last comment. There's an emerging subculture within our community, right, <clears throat> that, uh, I, well, I don't call them, they call themselves the quants. Anyone ever paid attention to, and they believe everything is a data problem. Um, everything uh, just means you don't, if you don't know the answer to a problem, it just means you don't have the data and you need to find it. So with that, I thank you again for your time and your attention. Very good.